Hi there. Uh, but before I even get going, Willem, I want to congratulate uh, that amazing experience getting the vaccine or the rodeo. Uh, I took my boy through there and it was just, everybody was so nice. It was so amazingly well organized. It was just a, uh, just a, a fantastic thing. Congratulations for- Thank you. I, thank you, Dr. Krasner. I, I just uh, am really happy that I work with such a group of, of professional people at that. And yes. it's a very well organized event, as you probably know. Yeah, it was just amazing how just crowds going through so quickly and being treated with such great respect and everything was really nice. So thank you. Yep. So I'm going to talk today about probably the two biggest changes going on in uh, antibiotic stewardship programs and management is paradigm shift. So, you know, a paradigm shift is like saying, uh, you know, you think the world is round and now we understand it's flat. So those, that's a paradigm uh, shift. And we're gonna talk about two of the major paradigm shifts that are going on in infectious diseases. But first, uh, Troy, you wanted to talk to this? So. Yeah, just a couple of disclaimers here, just letting you know that we do uh, record these sessions and make those available for anybody who maybe wasn't able to join us here today, or even those of you joining us right now that maybe wanna refer back to the information at a later date. If you have any concerns about being on that video, just let us know, send us something through the chat and we can edit you out of that recording. A reminder about PHI, so if you do present a patient case for us here today, please just do your best to omit any PHI and a uh, disclosure policy so we can provide CME and CEU credit for the session here today, just letting you know that none of the speakers today have any relevant conflicts of interest. All right, so we're going to talk about these real big shifts in the use of antibiotics for the last few years. I said a paradigm shift is a change in the way we, we think about things, and I think the two big paradigm shifts I want to talk about. One is that you know we've all just assumed along you know over the years that IV antibiotics are somehow superior to oral therapy, and uh, but we found now that uh, as we're going to talk that switching to oral can actually improve care, uh, be better a better patient experience, and actually have better outcomes. So there's there's no magic about IV antibiotic therapy. Uh, even though we've always assumed that. So we'll talk a lot about that. And the second is I'm going to talk about the evidence that we have that short course therapy of antibiotics uh, versus the long traditional long courses is actually beneficial to the patients and it's not cutting corners. So the two things I want to look at, one is, is the move away from IV antibiotics uh, in the hospital and in outpatient and the, the use of short course therapy. So we're going to talk about these two aspects and then I'll present some cases where you can think about it and we can see how it's helpful. So let's first talk about the switch from IV to oral conversion of antibiotics. And the Centers for Disease Control has put out this handout called the Core Elements of Hospital Antibiotic Stewardship. Every time I see this picture on the left, it looks like Hillary Clinton there, but I don't think it is. But anyways, um, the, they, they talk about pharmacy-driven interventions. And the number one list under pharmacy-driven intervention is the automatic changes from intravenous to oral antibiotics in the appropriate situation, using a lot of antibiotics that have equivalent absorption uh, orally uh, to the levels you'll get IV therapy. So like the quinolones, Bactrim, et cetera. And we're gonna go talk about that. So they have a whole, whole bunch of interventions for pharmacy, but number one on this key elements of antibiotic stewardship is the, is the conversion uh, from IV to oral therapy. Next slide. So these are some myths about IV therapy. One is that infectious diseases needs IV antibiotics and oral therapy should be used sparingly. Oral antibiotics are not equivalent to IV. You'll hear that a lot. I still hear it a lot from a lot of physicians. But as we talk about, we're gonna see that some agents have such excellent bioavailability that, that an oral agent can be equivalent to IV therapy. And I'm gonna go over some of the literature which supports the safe and effective switch from IV to oral uh, uh, treatments. The second thing is sometimes you'll hear from doctors is that, oh, I need to keep them on IV therapy else Medicare is not gonna reimburse for this hospitalization. And many people use intravenous antibiotics as a way as justifying a hospitalization, but Medicare will take into consideration that you may be treating other conditions, heart failure, uh, uh, diarrhea, et cetera, and will not hold, you, hold it against the patient uh, that, that he's only on oral therapy. And if somebody's doing well enough that it was on oral therapy, they probably can go home anyway. So these are the major myths that sort of are held against uh, the conversion from IV to oral therapy. Next. So what are some of the advantages of just changing from 
intravenous to oral therapy one, you get rid of the intravenous catheter, uh, PIC lines, central lines, which are, can be associated with infections themselves and also with clots and other complications. Secondly, it gets the patient out of the hospital faster. And thirdly, it can reduce the volume of fluid administered to a patient. For example, Bactrim given four times a day intravenously is 500 cc's four times a day. So you may be giving someone with heart failure as much as two liters of additional fluid when they can be safely switched to oral therapy. So there's other concerns about it. The patients are also happy. Most of the patients after a few days in the hospital are agitated and ready to go home. So the patient oftentimes is happier to be able to go home on oral therapy instead of having to stay in a nursing home or stay in the hospital for additional IV therapy. It allows the patient to take baths and doesn't have to worry about covering up his PICC line, reduces the risk of phlebitis, it reduces the workload on the pharmacy and nursing, and it decreased costs. So there's a lot of potential advantages from switching to IV to PO therapy. But again, that's on the assumption that IV to PO antibiotics can safely and effectively be switched. Next slide. But what could be potential disadvantages got to keep in mind? One, you know, a patient getting IV therapy three or four times a day in the hospital, and the nurse is making sure there's compliance. You may have trouble with giving somebody more than you know, a BID dosing at home. So there's also a possibility that they may not be as adherent with oral therapy. There's this question of less efficacy, which we'll go over depending on the clinical disease state. And obviously, if somebody doesn't have a functional bowel, I mean, they're vomiting, they have diarrhea, they have ileus and malabsorption, oral therapy is not uh, an option for them. So what are the best candidates for oral treatment conversion? One, you need to have good clinical data. That's obviously critical. Two, you have to have excellent bioavailability, which means that the, the, the uh, you know, IV levoquin versus oral levoquin gets, for example, has very similar drug levels so that you have excellent uh, effective uh, and therapeutic levels by taking orally. They obviously need to be well tolerated, either swallow and hopefully inexpensive. Sometimes you write for an antibiotic and you know, it's a $500 a day or some crazy price. So you wanna make it uh, less expensive for the patient. Next. So let's look up, talk about bioavailability of commonly used oral antibiotics. So how well are the antibiotics that we use commonly as oral treatment? How do they compare uh, to the IV form? So let's just look, let's just focus in on the green ones, 80 to 100%, 80 to 90 and 90%. Here we see a lot of the antibiotics we use every day. For example, amoxicillin, cephalexin, which is Keflex, ciprofloxacin, Bactrim, levofloxacin, Clinda, Flagyl, doxycycline, linazolide. So we have a lot of potential oral treatment that have excellent bioavailability. So this is sort of the important thing. Do we get good levels on our oral treatments? Next. And there's different types of IV to PO antibiotic conversions. One is like sequential therapy, where we go from IV levofloxacin at the same dose to oral levofloxacin because it has excellent bioavailability. We may have switch therapy. For example, levofloxacin may be started, but then we may switch to ciprofloxacin, a, a, a similar mechanism of action, but a different uh, compound with excellent potency. Or sometimes we have step-down therapy. We may, for example, use IV unison and now switch to a drug like Augmentum, which has a different frequency of activity, but also has similar efficacy. So these are all things we should take in mind when we start looking at can we safely go from IV to PO antibiotics? Is it uh, effective? And do we have good bioavailability? Next. So let's talk about the other paradigm shift. The antibiotic mantra is always, is now shorter is better. So we have IV to PO options that we're looking at. Now look about how about the, the length of therapy for these patients? So when penicillin, uh, when it was discovered, and, and they started using it in, in 1942, what they did was they only would, they would treat, for example, pneumonia with treatment courses as short as one and a half to four days. They, the patient would start getting better and they would stop treatment. It was in short supply, but they found out that we didn't have to treat until the patient was completely normal, but just improving. So it was short supply. They treated for as short as they can, as one and a half to four days. But later in the 1940s, the thought changed. They started thinking two things. One, Let's not, let's not wait, let's not just treat until he's clinically improved. Let's treat him until he's completely well. 
but that way we can somehow prevent relapse and complete complete the entire treatment course to prevent resistance. So two things: one, let's treat longer, and let's two, let's let's treat long enough, even though the patient's doing well. Let's treat them to make sure that uh, that bacteria we're treating doesn't become resistant to it. So based on these assumptions, we're seeing patients now getting as long as 14 days of IV rocephin for pyelonephritis to become a prescribed. Or patients being told to take the antibiotic completely till finish, no matter how well they feel. That's a commonly thing you tell, finish off your prescriptions, no matter how well you, you feel. But we know two things. One is that, for example, if you're treating pneumococcal pneumonia with rocephin, the pneumococcus clears out. But then you're continuing rocephin, even though they're feeling well, what you're doing is you're causing collateral damage. You're causing resistance to develop in the surrounding uh, bacteria, the E. coli, the, en the enter enterix, the other bacteria that are around. So even though you've taken care of the problem, what you're doing is inducing resistance in other bacteria, which may cause problems down the line, as well as causing C. diff issues. So bacterial resistance can develop in the collateral bacteria. And the other thing about developing resistance, if you're not taking an antibiotic, there's no pressure on the bacteria. So if you stop taking an antibiotic, you're not going to lead to resistance because there's no, there's no ecological pressure for the bacteria to mutate. So you have to be on an antibiotic to develop resistance. You're not preventing resistance. So there's a lot of evidence that one, that once a patient is improving, relapse is rare. And two, continuing antibiotics does not prevent relapse, but it does lead to issues with resistance. And so now we're going, we're only going back to the future. We're not only treating for shorter courses, uh, we're finding excellent outcomes and the development of less resistance and less complications like C. diff. Next, next uh, slide. So these are some of the courses that we're gonna talk about. Short course therapy, which is shown to be efficacious with less side, of, with less, uh, side effects and resistance developing. For example, pyelonephritis, I'm going to present a case now and present it to you, can now be treated with five to seven days instead of 10 to 14 days. Intra-abdominal infection with source control can be four days versus 10 days. Cellulitis, five days instead of 10 days. And osteomyelitis with shorter courses. Next. So let's, so we've talked about IV to PO conversion. Does that work? And two, the shorter course therapy work. And so we're going to see in these cases where you can combine both shorter courses of therapy and IV conversion allows you to effectively treat your patient, get them out of the hospital, increase patient satisfaction, and uh, do extremely well. So this is a, a typical patient. Let's talk about her. She's a 46-year-old woman, previously healthy. She comes to the emergency with fever, left-sided flank pain, nausea, and vomiting. Her white count is 16,000. She's somewhat dehydrated, her BUN is significantly above her creatinine. She has a packed ear analysis. An ultrasound is done in the ER showing uh, perinephric uh, stranding consistent with pyelonephritis. She's otherwise, the, CT, uh, the ultrasound is complete, uh, otherwise normal. So she started on IV fluids because she's dehydrated and vomiting, and she receives empiric coverage with ceftriaxone. By day three, she feels fine, her fever is gone, but blood and urine cultures are both growing out E. coli. Standard patient. So what would you do in this situation? And we'll, we'll talk about the chances. One, would you trans, transition her to outpatient IV therapy to complete seven days of treatment? So would you continue the rocephin for seven more days, for a total of seven days? Would you transition her to outpatient IV therapy for 14 days? She was bacteremic, she has pilo, you wanna do 14 days of IV therapy. Would you switch her to an oral regimen to complete seven days of therapy? Or would you switch her to oral therapy to complete 14 days? On day three, when she's doing better, your susceptibility report comes back. It's ampicillin resistant because it produces, it produces a beta-lactam base, which is standard. The cefazolin, which is first generation, it's insensitive to it. If it's sensitive to cefazolin, it will be sensitive to all the cephalosporins. So we know the row seven is working fine. It's sensitive to the quinolone, ciprofloxacin. It's sensitive to Bactrim. So we have drugs, Bactrim, Cipro, uh, ampicillin, which is resistant to, but we have oral options. So what would you do? And what's the evidence for one of the four choices? So let's, 
discuss this. Let me show you. Next slide. So this was a study that looked at this question, one of multiple studies. This said seven versus 14 days of antibiotic therapy for uncomplicated gram-negative bacteremia, a non-inferiatory randomized controlled trial. And what they did was they took about 600 uncomplicated gram-negative uh, bacteremia patients. So uncomplicated means it's like this patient with pyelonephritis. It wasn't like she had a, a stone obstructing her ureters. It wasn't like she had a perinephric abscess. It wasn't like she was in renal failure. It's just basically gram-negative bacteremia, no reason for her not to respond to treatment. So they randomized these patients to either seven or 14 days of antibiotic therapy. Most of the sources, as you can imagine, were urinary or intra-abdominal. Initial therapy was IV, as you would with any sick uh, hospitalized patient. And they called the first day of an effective antibiotic was called day number one. So if they were treating with the wrong antibiotic, it didn't count. They, they looked at the day number one of effective antibiotic therapy. Once culture results were available, if they were candidates for oral treatment, 75% of them were now able to be switched from IV, ceftriaxone to oral fluoroquinolone, like Cipro, Levoquin, beta-lactam, like Augmentum, or Bactrim, to complete therapy. And they wanted to see, they wanted to wait 90 days for outcome because they may feel better in two weeks, but maybe three or four weeks later, they relapse or get C. diff or some other complication. So they're very, uh, conservative. Let's see how these patients after 90 days out, how are they doing in terms of adverse effects, resistance development, or C. diff incidence. Back. So they found absolutely no difference. Uh, so they, they found that seven days of IV to oral switch after seven days was as effective as 14 days of IV antibiotics. Uh, and there was really no difference. So they, they mm -hmm. felt seven days could be effective treatment for these patients. Next slide. And so uncomplicated gram-negative bacteremia, seven days should be the new 14. Instead of 14 days, it should be seven days and combined safely with oral step-down therapy. So uncomplicated gram-negative bacteremia, for example, this lady with pyelonephritis, E. coli, but no obstruction, no perinephric abscess, clinically improving and afavorable after 48 hours can be safely uh, switched over to oral therapy to complete it. For example, if a patient with acute cholecystitis comes in with Klebsiella in his blood, he gets source control with move of the gallbladder, he would also be a good candidate uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, short course therapy. But a patient, you would not, this would not be appropriate for a patient with undrained diverticular abscess, for example, who are on pressors in the ICU or other complicated cases. But a straightforward case, source control, no, no uh, concerns that's gonna stop their improvement you can safely do this. And this has been shown to be very effective. You know, you say, oh, this makes sense. We just had a patient, I won't say which hospital, who uh, the patient fell, hit his head, an older man, and he came in and he had, uh, he had an E. coli in his urine. And the physician, uh, despite our uh, protest, uh, was very concerned uh, that he may relapse and he, he scheduled the patient to go to the nursing home for 14 days of IV antibiotics. Okay, so this is something that goes on and, but this is something that really helps get a patient out quickly. If they're, if they're basically healthy patients, you can switch them to oral and, be, and feel very comfortable. And as we said, it makes sense because we see that uh, drugs like Augmentum, Ciprofloxacin, Levoquin, give us as good a coverage as IV therapy. And that's the whole reason that IV versus oral should be equivalent and allow people to get out sooner too. Next. So this is a very common thing, especially for people to see outpatients. This is a case presentation I'm gonna present. Uh, take a look at this. So 68 year old male has a history of heart failure. He sees his primary care doctor. He diagnoses him with bilateral leg cellulitis. Uh, he's given a five day course of cephalexin, which is Keflex. And he returns for clinic follow-up with no improvement in his legs. So you can see on his legs bilaterally, there's edema, there's some erythema, desquamation. Would you do this? Would you admit to the patient for intravenous antibiotics? Would you switch him to doxycycline because Keflex doesn't cover MRSA and doxy does? Would you have him rest at home with elevation, reduce salt intake and apply steroid cream and moisturizer to his legs? 
So let's look at this case. So he's been on Keflex. He hasn't improved. And uh, he has, you have, as his primary care physician, you'd want to know what should I do next? Next slide. So if you work in the hospital, we've heard this, and you work as a hospitalist, you've heard this many times. I've been on oral antibiotics for 36 hours. My cellulitis isn't improving. My doctor sent me in because I need IV antibiotics. Many patients are admitted to the hospital for intravenous antibiotics after failing oral therapy with medications like cep cephalexin, which is Keflex, doxycycline, But we know that these are all antibiotics that very well absorbed. So the question is, are IV antibiotics somehow stronger for skin and soft tissue infections? So a Cochran, which is, this is an organization that does meta-analysis and looks at different you know, topics, the treatment of various cancers, infections, everything. In 2010, they had a summary on antibiotics for cellulitis. They found it, they found it hard to compare studies because their design and treatments were all different. However, in their summary, they stated, quote, no single treatment was clearly superior, IV versus PO. But surprisingly, oral antibiotics appeared to be more effective than antibiotics given into a vein for moderate and severe cellulitis. And this merits further study, which is a very surprising study when we say patients are being admitted after failing oral treatment for IV therapy. So how could this be? Next slide, please. Let's talk about, so this patient who was given Keflex and he would probably be admitted to the hospital and put on cephalozolin, which has similar activity. But you know the, the, the physician says, oh, I can get much better and more effective levels using cephalozolin than I can using Keflex. But, so what, when we treat patients, for example, with uh, antibiotics, particularly beta-lactams, what we need to do is we, we have something called concentration-independent killing. What that means is that once you get levels above a certain level, so called the MIC, what's the level, what's the concentration of antibiotics that inhibits the growth of the bacteria? That's called the MIC. But you wanna be above that MIC in your drug levels but a majority of the time of the, drug, of the dosing interval. So it's concentration independent, which also means that if you're above the MIC, it doesn't matter if it's five times higher or 500 times higher, you're not gonna get better killing. It's, you, you only you can achieve a certain amount of killing per, per hour or whatever. You cannot go so high in the levels that you're going to improve the killing. So what we want to do is check how does Keflex versus Cephazone, how does it give us levels above the MIC? Is it somehow Cephazone is more is above the MIC a greater part of the time than Keflex? Maybe Keflex doesn't have good blood levels, so we can't achieve it. So if you look on the bottom, we see strep pyogenes. So strep pyogenes has an MIC, what concentration? It's actually much less than 0 0.1 micrograms, so just 0 0.1. So what's the concentration that we get when we give somebody Keflex? Cephalexin's on the left. It has a half-life about an hour. The peak concentration is at an hour. And if we give somebody 1,000 milligrams of Keflex, the peak serum drug concentration is 32. So switching, if you look on the other side, the peak concentration of cephazolin on two grams is about, on a thousand grams, about 180. But the point is that both of these concentrations are hundreds of times higher than the MIC. So we're not gaining anything by switching from Keflex to Cephazone. We get extremely good levels. So at one hour, this, the peak concentration of Keflex is about 32. If it has a half-life of an hour, that means after two hours, it's down to 16. At three hours, down to eight. At four hours, it's down to uh, four. So you're many times above that strep pyogenes level uh, to inhibit the growth with oral uh, Keflex. Staph aureus also has a slightly higher MIC, but it's still less than one. So to say that this patient is, needs IV antibiotics, whether it's cephazolin or clindamycin, we're getting extremely effective levels, many times above what we need to inhibit the growth with oral therapy. So what we must do is maybe we need to reevaluate our diagnosis. Okay, patients may not need IV therapy. Maybe the diagnosis is wrong. Next slide. So excellent oral drug levels we see far above the level needed to kill the bacteria. So you, you're not gonna gain anything by switching to IV. You're just putting the patient in the hospital, taking the risk of IV therapy. So why is this patient not responding to the Keflex? First of all, it may take two to three days before improvement is noted. Second of all, in the hospital, the patient is basically off their feet, elevated, 
allowing the swelling to go down while the nurses and the aides help him uh, do his activities. So he's giving his legs a rest and the swelling is going down. Third, maybe the diagnosis, maybe he has an abscess that needs drainage that was missed on exam, but it certainly doesn't look like it. But most likely in this patient, and the ones that we see over the, every day being admitted to the hospital, good chance the diagnosis is wrong. And I've talked previously about pseudocellulitis. 40% of the cellulitis cases are actually misdiagnosed, most commonly stasis dermatitis, heart failure, gout, phobias, et cetera. So what would you do with this patient? Any thoughts? Or what you thought your diagnosis may, may actually be? Stasis dermatitis, patient just needs steroid cream. Correct, exactly. So this is so commonly, you know, we, do, we look at a lot of patients in the hospital, they're being admitted because they're failing Keflex and they say, oh, I need IV therapy, but they have stasis dermatitis. This patient has, first of all, pseudomonas, uh, not pseudomonas, cellulitis doesn't just stay there. It's a rapidly progressive unilateral uh, rash. This guy has bilateral stasis, he has desquamation. So the diagnosis is wrong. So when you see patients who say, oh, I'm failing Keflex or I'm failing clindamycin or doxy, which are all excellent, well-absorbed antibiotics, maybe you need to reevaluate the diagnosis, okay? Because I'm showing you that we get excellent levels uh, with some oral treatments. Yeah, so that patient just needs to have his feet elevated. But we see that every day these patients being admitted because they quote, they need IV therapy. But we can see we get beautiful levels, as good as IV in almost all these medicines. So if somebody's not responding to an outpatient uh, antibiotics, maybe reevaluate the diagnosis. We're getting, uh, I'm not gonna talk about this, but basically it's a study that's showed that the treatment of osteomyelitis, you know, everybody says, of course, IV, you need IV therapy for osteomyelitis, but this was a landmark study called the Ovivia study, which basically looked at intravenous versus oral antibiotics for the management of, uh, uh, you know, bone infections, prosthetic joint infections. And in every uh, uh, category, it was shown to be equal or more effective to treat with oral therapies. Uh, you know, I see people with IV antibiotics for six weeks when they could simply be treated oftentimes with uh, oral treatment. So this has been the, uh, the move away from IV therapy is really, a, I'd say, a paradigm shift that we don't need IV therapy for almost every condition after, you know, as soon as, as, soon as they're stabilized, particularly something as, as serious as osteomyelitis. So go down, let's go to the end of it. So I'll skip my, my slides on this. Next. Next study. So. Don't settle for the status quo of antibiotic prescribing, okay? Does this patient really need IV antibiotics for his entire treatment regimen? We've definitely shown that once a patient is stabilized, uh, you can almost always successfully switch somebody based on the susceptibilities. We have a whole penelope of uh, you know, drugs that have fantastic oral absorption, whether it's Augmentum, Septra, the Quinolones, Clindamycin, Doxycycline, that basically equivalent to what we get by IV therapy. So. There's no magic about IV therapy and all IV therapy gives you are, are side effects, expense, and an unha unhappy patient. Secondly, we don't have to go the old way of thinking that we need to treat patients uh, until they're completely well and then continue it so they don't get relapse. All we're doing when we're doing that is that we're setting them up uh, for uh, complications of antibiotics, okay? And do I really need to admit stable patients with quote cellulitis just didn't get IV therapy, uh, probably not. So, so it's agreed that we pursue radical changes as long as it doesn't impact upon current practices and policies. Okay, so this is some, you know, on our antibiotic stewardship rounds, we see it over and over again, patients not being switched to orals, being overtreated for long courses of therapy, getting complications like nursing home patients getting C. diff from unnecessary antibiotics. And so just start thinking about, uh, what you're doing when you're prescribing antibiotics and say we, you know, IV is not the cure-all. So some of your, I'd like to hear some of your, your thoughts, uh, what you guys are doing in the hospital or as outpatients. Go ahead, Patty. <clears throat> oh, you're, you're still on mute there. There you go. Okay, here we go. Um, yes, the thing about, you know, when you see the bilateral, 
the leg thing, I mean, that's kind of yeah. a clue as an outpatient that that may not be cellulitis. And we always look for a fever and I usually do a CMP and see how the kidney function is doing to kind of assess stability. Um, but, you know, if I could, I noticed that in the, the one of the original slides in terms of bioavailability, dicloxacillin yeah. was on the bottom. It was not one of the green ones. <clears throat> and I'm going to just take my shot here. I've got a patient I'm going to see in about eight minutes. Uh, she's had uh, recurrent uh, mastitis. We've been, we, she, we've worked up her breast health uh, with mammogram, I mean, with MRI. So she's back to uh, annual mammogram. So there's actually no concern about cancer. You know, this is all recent, but she's back. I treated her 10 days ago with dicloxacillin 500, two tabs twice a day, I think for 10 days or for seven days that was in the right breast. And now she's back with what sounds like the same thing in the left breast. And I, my eye went right to that dicloxacillin as being low on the bioavailability. I wonder if you could advise me just based on that. Well, mas mastitis is usually either Staph aureus or MRSA. Do you have a culture on her? Yes, the culture that was done on the right breast, uh, on, I think on May 5th or 4th, actually did not show, it showed, uh, I got it right here. It was not pathogenic actually. Um, it was four plus, let's see. <clears throat> yeah, it first it didn't have a result in 24 hours and then it was four plus coagulase negative staph, no pathogen isolated. Um, in, in February of 2020, when this happened previously, and at this time we weren't done with the breast cancer workup, that time yes. it showed, uh, grandpa, uh, yeah, it, it did show, what was that? Um, Staphylococcus capitis subspecies urealiticus or something like that. So That's that a one did, negative staph, yes. Yeah. So she's not really responding to antibiotics. So could, could this be a surgical issue that she needs something drained or opened up or a cyst or something like that? Because it, these are just skin flora, what you're describing, and you have her on a reasonable regimen. So I don't, if it was Staph Warriors or MRSA, yes, I would say you need to do it. But I would, I would probably have her see a, a breast surgeon to take a look at that, okay? Because that the coag negative staph is just your skin. So you, you're not getting a pathogen and she's continuing to go and your antibiotics are reasonable. The thing I don't like about Diclox, it's, it's four times a day. And I think you would, uh, no one takes anything four times a day. And so, you know, doxycycline is great for staph and MRSA. Uh, Keflex, if you know, it's not MRSA. Uh, clindamycin, you always worry about uh, with C. diff, but doxycycline or Bactrim are two excellent drugs for staph and MRSA. So you see somebody with an abscess, you're not sure which one, you're gonna get great levels with doxycycline and uh, Bactrim. The other thing about doxycycline is you may want to load them the first day because it takes a while to get good levels. So like 200 BID the first day, then 100 BID, but uh, you're not going to get great strep coverage, but doxy and Bactrim for like, if I saw a woman with breast mastitis, I would use either of those two options. But she's not, your culture is a negative, they're recurring. I would have her maybe take, have a surgeon take a look at her. Just one, thank you so much for that interesting clinical thing on this one. <clears throat> All of these, infections happened immediate within uh, a week or two, or let's say one to four weeks after a ma the mammogram. And she has fibrocystic breast. So it, it's like the, yeah. you know, the squishing is, seems to be what's yeah. causing these. Just an interesting point, but thank you very much. Probably, probably <laughs> doesn't help, but yeah, I, I would say you've cultured and you're not coming up with a pathogen and it's recurring. So maybe there's a breast specialist who'd be able to see her. Alrighty, thanks Patty for sharing that case with us here today. Other questions or cases we can address with the group here, feel free to unmute or write into the chat box, please. But I would, you know, I would keep those drugs in mind that have excellent oral bioavailability. Uh, as I said, the common ones we use, the Bactrim, the Keflex at a, like a thousand milligrams TID, uh, the quinolones, uh, doxycycline are all excellent, equal to IV therapy uh, for the stable patient. And uh, the shorter course, the treatments are really important too. 
is again, we see people getting 14 days of IV antibiotics for something that could be seven days uh, with IV to oral, oral conversion quickly. Cool. All righty, well, we'll go ahead and wrap up today's session. Thank you everybody for, for being here. Really appreciate your participation.